with um, introducing Introduce ourselves. This is the board of the IO500 committee, and I'm Andreas Dilger, um, principal architect for Luster. And hi, I'm Dean Hildebrand, um, technical director in the office of the CTO at Google. I'm Julian Kunkel. I'm a professor at the University of Göttingen and a co-director of the GWTD. Jay. Okay, I mean, Jay, ah, can't hear they can't hear us? But yeah, George, maybe. Um, Okay. But, yeah, I'm George Marcomanolis, uh, lead HPC scientist at the uh, CSC in Finland. I might have lost audio. Okay. Jay, uh, okay, okay you. you're back, Jay. Oh, no. Jay, we could hear you just there. Um, moving on. So today we have a very full agenda and, um, so the, the BOF is only a 35 and so we're going to go straight into the content. As you can see, uh, George is up next and he'll be telling us about what's new with the R500. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, a bit short slides. Um, what's new about the web page? Uh, we're continuously improving and fixing uh, bugs uh, thanks to San Luca Bez. Uh, we thank the people who report them, they found some bugs. And uh, remind you, you can always submit issues in this GitHub uh, link. And also, we started including uh, the student classroom competition lists. Now you can go to, for example, to SC19 and you click SCC and you see the list. Uh, about the i500 status, uh, we remind you that we check the, the versions that you are using while you run the benchmark. So please use the correct versions, ISC year and SC year, the corresponding ones. Um, uh, exploring users of the new phases in the benchmark uh, with a lot of development from uh, Julian. Um, we'll have open discussion for future inclusion, and there are some options that activate a uh, new experimental phases about IR uh, random, find this, find hard uh, to be discussed, and uh, metadata work bench, so it's different than empty tests. And of course, exploring storage seamless, improving with your feedback, which is always uh, welcome. Uh, about the status, this is the same, but many people maybe they don't know yet. Uh, I-500 Foundation is a non-profit organization. Uh, domain, mailing list, servers, GitHub belongs to the foundation. Uh, our new web page, which is, is basically is since uh, the last list, the i500.org. You can contribute the, from this link, you can create uh, issues and uh, PRs. And please join our mailing list in this link. And of course, our Slack, uh, we're really active on the Slack. You can scan the QR code or follow the link. Yes, board changes. Uh, John Bent has stepped down from the board. We we'll thank him for uh, co-founding and supporting the IF500. His new role is really demanding. And Dean is replacing uh, John on the board. Uh, he's a technical director for storage and HPC uh, at Office of the CTO of Google Cloud and has many previous positions, principal research staff member on Spectrum Scale, the classic GPFS, IBM Research, etc. Welcome, Dean. Um, ongoing specifications for the hardware SEMA. Uh, some people uh, <laughs> use it a lot. Improve submission SEMA towards more in, in intuitive and less ambiguous approach, supporting uh, storage system specific SEMAs, uh, last uh, GPFS, etc. Remove uncertainty about the semantics of fields. Uh, we're still working on it. We get feedback and we improve it. Start integrating tools to automatically collect system configuration. You can read there is plenty of uh, simplified collection of system details for end users. And we try to capture a lot of information about the system. Uh, no need to read all of this. And more improvements are planned. But we need community input to refine schemas and better populate submissions. We understand some people with a new file system, they cannot find all the fields. We hear you and we're fixing this. And more submission information allows better analysis and comparisons to be more fair and more correct. Um, 
I-500 is part of the benchmarks in the Supercomputing Student Classic Competition 2021. Um, uh, the in teams will bring their own hardware. The virtual will access a Microsoft Azure. It will be hybrid for the moment, totally 11 teams. And if supercomputing is only virtual, all teams will use Azure and another cloud provider, probably. And for more information, uh, this is the link, studentclassicalcompetitions.us. Uh, so now I'll start the list of analysis and analysis. Thanks, George. Um, so we're going to post uh, the lists and then as well as some scatter plots uh, on our website um, that will show you all of the you know uh, changes and the top numbers and everything else over the years. Um, and so I thought instead of focusing on that, since you'll be able to see all of those uh, charts. Um, pretty soon, I take a sort of a different look at uh, some of the things that we don't post on our website. And so the first one here is simply around the number of submissions. Um, as you can see, the list is growing nicely over the last four years. Um, but the really nice thing here is that the number of institutions is growing as well. So it's not just the same uh, people <laughs> submitting continuously. And the other thing um, is that while the number of submissions gone, has gone down a little bit, um, it's really stabilizing at this point. And so I think that that's great. If we can keep that up, um, you know, I think we'll uh, you know, be, be able to grow this list really nicely. Um, one thing to remember is SC19 was a bit of a strange list in that we revamped it from the previous years. And so the number is a little higher there. So I think we're at a consistent rate um, after that. Uh, next slide. So almost exactly the same thing for the TED Known Challenge. As you can see, um, list is growing, number of institutions are growing, and uh, the list uh, new new entries every year is, is somewhat stabilizing. Uh, next. So uh, I added up all the bandwidth and uh, from the, the lists. And so, yeah, it's a really neat thing this year is we've passed 10 terabytes per second on write bandwidth, and we've passed 15 terabytes per second on read bandwidth. So you know we're really charting nicely over the years in terms of the the aggregate bandwidth. These are from the the easy read and write uh, tests. Uh, next, and so as well as you'll see on the on the web page, you know the top scores are growing um, very nicely, uh, but. I think it's also interesting to look at the median scores in terms of, you know, is the core set uh, also growing? And I think it is also at a nice rate, um, you know, somewhere in, you know, the 11 to 13, 32% range uh, for over the years, uh, the the top score, the, the median score is growing, which I really think means that we're not just getting, you know, a few top scores that are submitted every year. It really is uh, growing the, the middle of the list as well. And so this is a really healthy sign, in my opinion, and, and really great and really encourage everyone to please keep submitting and growing the aggregate size of the list, uh, regardless if you're in the top two or three or 10 or whatever. It, it, you know, it's really neat to see all the different ways that um, people are, are achieving really great results on the list. So thank you again for everyone for that. Uh, next. And uh, so then what I did is look at, okay, so um, what are the scores and the bandwidth and metadata uh, growing as we look at the number of clients and then as we look at the number of storage servers? Um, and so here you can see that, um, well, the score, uh, the top score was flat somewhat. Um, this year, it jumped up. Um, so we had a bit of a, a growth there. And then it actually looks like the metadata is the one that grew the largest. But in fact, uh, the bandwidth score grew four times this year. Um, so we're seeing both incredible growth on the top end of the bandwidth and the metadata. Um, over time, but as well as specifically uh, into this list. So definitely bigger systems. Uh, and this, again, is per client, um, uh, not just the, the, the overall top, uh, top. Next. And so when we look and we constrain it to only 10 clients, um, you know, we're seeing another interesting sort of uh, effect here where the metadata really skewed from the, the bandwidth. 
where uh, the bandwidth is growing per client, meaning we're getting uh, you know bigger, fatter clients clearly in terms of the bandwidth. But the metadata score is really uh, the the incredible increase here at, at ten times um, for every client on on the ten client list. Uh, next, um, and so then if we look at um, the the storage servers it's interesting because you can see a somewhat of a different picture here where the per client scores were growing at an incredible rate the per storage server scores are actually growing somewhat incrementally um, as you can see the the bandwidth per storage server has not really increased that much um, you know it, it doubled um, between isc20 and sc20 but into ISC 21 now we're actually stabilized and so this interesting thing here is that clearly the number of storage servers is growing because the per client scores are growing up so much but for every individual storage server um, the results are, are growing somewhat uh, but not in any significant huge manner in, at, at the top end um, which really I think is sort of a, a an indication of how um, we're using more clients we're getting bigger systems but individually on every server, it's it's not changing that radically. Um, and yeah, that's it for me. So off to the awards. Thanks. Um, Andreas, I can't hear anybody. Yeah. All right. All right. So. As um, with previous years, we're uh, presenting six different awards, um, both for the full list and the 10 no challenge. Uh, list has uh, the three main components, bandwidth, metadata, and the overall score. Next. This year, you can see in the 10 no challenge, um, the uh, bandwidth winner for 10 nodes is entry on the Endeavor system, and that's running Deos, and they got um, an impressive uh, score. The um, thing that's, that's uh, interesting here is that these are including, you know, as as was described earlier, these are including the, the they can um, drive a very high bandwidth through 10 nodes, even with a very difficult I.O. load. Um, George, so congratulations, Intel, on winning the bandwidth challenge. Next. So on the metadata side, uh, Peng posted a new score for the 10 node uh, challenge and um, a very impressive uh, metadata almost 35 um, billion or 35 million operations per second and um, uh, uh, actually first let's move on George um, to the certificate congratulations to Peng Cheng on winning the 10 node uh, metadata on the CloudBrain 2 system and so overall um, Peng Cheng was able to win the ten no challenge, and so while um, Intel had about double the uh, bandwidth score, um, four times the uh, metadata score for that system, and the aggregate score is, you know, due to the geometric root about root two faster than Intel, and so next slide. Congratulations to Peng Cheng Lab the 10 note challenge. Next. So on the full list, this is with uh, unlimited numbers of nodes and um, storage servers. And so uh, on this system, uh, this uh, was able to get an impressive 3.4 terabytes per second um, for the bandwidth with 512 
so 512, even though it's shown here, 512 uh, storage servers. So congratulations to for winning the overall bandwidth score. And on the metadata side, this is quite, um, they were able to get uh, 396 million um, metadata operations per second aggregate across eight different uh, metadata phases. And so uh, Peng Cheng with the MATFS file system was the winner of the score this year. Next. And of course, by virtue of winning both the bandwidth um, Peng Chang also wins the overall um, overall list score, and um, they were able to increase their score over from last year significantly. And George, thank you. Um, congratulations to Peng Chang on winning the overall I/O five hundred uh, list of. Yes. And uh, one thing that's worth mentioning is there is a presentation from um, Peng Cheng Laboratory that describes Matt number of requests after their win from the last year's list on what MATFS is. And so we were able to get um, and uh, a presentation from them. And due to time constraints, uh, we can't show the full presentation the supplementary um, slides will be available from the io 500 website thanks george we can move on so the next is the roadmap for the io 500 we, we want of course continue the improvement of the web page this year we we were sometimes a little bit less agile due to the new way of managing the web page um, over GitHub. But I think overall it was a big win because it is now really open for the community to contribute and very transparent what we are doing. Secondly, we want to continue to improve the system schema. It was, of course, not completed as George has reported. So we want to actually make sure that all the information that users and uh, data centers have about the system that they can insert this in a language that is very close to what they are used to. That's the ultimate goal. We are not yet there. We need the community actually to help us to define the suitable schemas. We had been in contact with some vendors to improve the schemas, but not yet. We are there that we have all the necessary fields. Secondly, we of course thank our submitters and we need their continuous support to populate information about the systems using the schema. And that's quite some effort. So we really are very thankful. We are working on scripts to automatically collect this kind of system metadata and fill it into the schema. There are already some scripts available that populate parts of this data, but we will continue to work on this approach. As next, we try to release um, the call for submission a little bit earlier and uh, the test code version um, to ease the burden of you um, to make submissions. Another ongoing effort is the documentation of the benchmarking phases. We want to really document the rationals behind these benchmarking phases. And we actually are now in the process to integration of new benchmarking phases, which leads us, in fact, to the discussion where we hope you will be eager to discuss those and other points in a minute with us. So that's next, George. Ted, do you have audio? Probably not. I cannot hear him. Yeah. Can you go to the next slide, maybe? Oops. Oh yeah, so we we talked about this, I suppose, right? Um, additional presentations are available, and I posted the links as well. 
or check them out in your own time. Next. Okay, you can. I we cannot hear you. I think it's a problem with the configuration. So does anyone else want to host those slides or should I just continue until Jay works? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. okay. So yeah, this is a very a topic that is very dear to me. Um, the discussion about new benchmarking phases. So IO500 tries to be, of course, conservative, tries to generate numbers that are valid in the long run and that we can track. Is it working? Huh. Does it work now, Jay? I think it does, finally. Okay, let me just finish my sentence and then... Yes, it's working. Okay, but at the same time, we want to be sure that the metrics that we cover, the scores that we cover, that they cover the applications that matter to the users in data centers. For that reason, we are really thinking about the benchmarking phases. Do we have all the benchmarking phases that we need? Did we miss something out? Do we need to split and so on? So there are a couple of discussions ongoing and now I pass on to Jay. All right, everybody. Sorry about the tech problems here. The um, just to kind of build a little bit on what Julian was saying there is that one of the, the efforts that we have internally right now is to really motivate all of our benchmarks based off of actual applications and real workloads. And um, so that's really what we're trying to push at is what kinds of things are we addressing with our current benchmarks and what kinds of things do people believe are important that we should add as additional benchmarks uh, going forward. And um, we have our process already, and that process is um, uh, documented on the website, but I believe we have a slide for it here. There, there's our change request slide. Um, basically, you create a, a one-page proposal about what you'd like to have happen and send it to us, and um, we'll figure out, is that something that we can use um, and how to make it work? And, um, but the, the link for looking at that in more detail later is there on the bottom right of the slide. Um, so, what we're trying to, to ask in this community discussion is, um, what's missing? We know that something that's come up many times is a 4K random read-write. We don't know exactly what that represents and haven't been able to get a good answer other than it's a common thing people measure. That's one example. And the other one is um, there's still not a, a broadly accepted machine learning suite of um, benchmarks that we could adopt as well. And um, we know that there are multiple different workloads on that, depending on which algorithms you're using. But there hasn't been one that has come up that's been particularly um, useful or well adopted. So um, I wanted to open up the discussion at this point and see what people are interested in, where they think our gaps are in terms of what we're looking at, and um, try to go from there. Uh, the other thing that we're trying to look at is um, and this has also been a long-term project is where do we draw the line in terms of what is a fair system to be included versus one that's not and these are the different things that everybody's seen um, over the years and, and had questions about very legitimate ones and uh, simple ones may be as much as how much um, security do you need in your data persistence for example do you have to have something like a RAID system or um, is having just single devices that may have faster um, I.O., is that sufficient? And do you have to have any um, additional concurrency and um, um, corruption controls turned on, or can you turn them off because you know that your I.O. libraries handle it? Um, there's big performance impacts based on these decisions. So these are other issues that um, if people have ideas, um, we haven't been able to come to a an agreement on what exactly the how to actually draw the line in these kinds of different systems because um, the lines seem to be very very blurry to us. So next slide, George. All right. So with that, um, anybody can comment on any of these, and um, we'll try our best to include you in the conversation uh, long term so that we can try to come to some good conclusions on this. We just submitted a poll regarding benchmarking phases. So feel free to fill this poll. Let's see if that works. Okay. 
that's the third of the the chat q a and then third one is polls if you're on your um, looking at your screen there well no one else is talking i guess i'll do the talking again ken carlisle here uh Hi, troublemaker um so a couple of things uh that uh based on this um what would be useful to me in terms of making the io 500 a more real world thing for my users would be um some kind of test that used or emulated what is being called chunk storage uh such as uh dot z-a-r-r czar files or czar agglomerations of files um those tend to be very small files and high quantities in a directory. So the MD test hard kind of applies, but not quite. And we're looking for a lot of random access within that structure. Um, N5 is another example of these things. It's a very simplistic way of describing them would be that they're basically exploded H5 files. Or HDF five. So instead of a single file, they're all the files. Right. So, so there, that, that's my request for that. Um, in terms of gripes and complaints, um, I'm not going to rehash all the things I've rehashed before, uh, but I did have a suggestion um, regarding the long tail problem, which I see you didn't put on the slide. Um, and what I'm thinking this sort of thought I've been bopping around is if the long tail, the, the, the stone wall was based not off of the fastest writer, which one finished the most, if it wasn't based on that, but rather the mean or the median or something like that. So you don't end up with that huge tail caused by either a ridiculously fast writer for some reason or a ridiculously slow writer. You get something more in the middle. Um, and I think that would be much more informative than going, oh yeah, yeah. Um, the score of this one got tanked because one client was super duper slow and it took an hour instead of five minutes. That's not really yeah, useful I mean, information. Mm -hmm. so, well, and, and yeah. the one thing that's, um, you know, with the real applications, right? Typically, you know, if they're doing checkpoints or, you know, writing data, you know, all write the same amount of data, but unlike the, you know, the Stonewall implementation today, um, a fixed amount of data that each rank will write, you know, they have a fixed erase or, you know, they need to write out some amount of data you know, client is much faster than the others is not harming, you know, the aggregate throughput of the other, the other rank. And, you know, you, you typically in HPC's, you know, storage system design, they say that, you know, 10% or less of the, um, of the, you know, compute time can be used for storage, you know, defense. And so they tried to say, you know, five, five minutes or less IO for writing out checkpoints an hour. And um, that's what comes from in, in the, you know, IOR hard and easy write phases. But I mean, I, I agree something like uh, median would actually um, be useful. The, the tricky part then is that what do you do with the files that the early clients wrote that are fast, you know, faster, right? Well, right now, they just sit around. So it's, they sit around and wait. No, I, but the, the, the file sizes large. will be larger, uh, right, I see than... Mean. I see what you mean. Okay, so there's yeah, a, a, a current to the, the optimizing number of files or size of files written by hand and i don't think anybody wants to do that yeah so there's a, a 
question from Kelsey, hello, um, about whether there are rules on persistence of the data. And mm -hmm. I mean, one of the, the things that already does exist in um, the IO500, the data has to be accessible from other nodes, right? And so that's one of the ways that we can indirectly verify that the because, um, you know, if, if all of the data was only cached in memory on the, the client that wrote it, you wouldn't be able to read the data from another node, right? Yeah. And so that's... Uh, and, um, yeah, and in the rules, it does say strictly that all data must be persisted to stable storage um, as part of the timing. That is actually part of the, the rules themselves, so yeah. Yeah, and so it's very difficult, right? Yeah. Difficult. Um, I was more bringing that up as an example. If we're thinking of adding more restrictions, maybe we should think about enforceability alongside of it. Because if you add rules and don't simultaneously add an ability to enforce it, you can create um, sort of an unequal playing field if some people are trying to break the rules and some people aren't. That was all I meant. That was just a specific example. I'm aware of the challenges in enforcing that specific one. But it would be great maybe to not add things as rules if we're looking at adding about more of every twenty first. Yeah, that, um, we we try to verify the entries and look at the hardware characteristics and um, what scores are being reported and what the software stacks are and what we know about them as a way to try to say does this number look reasonable as the persistence is actually being enforced. Um, we, it's difficult beyond that other than having conversations, which we have had with some of the submissions saying this number is, um, it seems uh, extremely high. Um, are you sure all the persistence features are turned on and what have you done to ensure that? So we have checked those kinds of things, but um, automatic enforcement is difficult. But yeah, that, that is a, a strong concern for us as well, because if you could go just pure RAM um, yeah, we could really blow out the scores. And at that point, it's not a storage thing. It's really a CPU string match and mem copy test. So one of the things... Oh, go, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Julian. Okay, so I made the poll about should we split the list into production and non-production. The reason is that we saw over the last couple of years that a couple of systems that rank very high, they are basically non-production system. And we wonder if that may discourage production systems to submit because they don't get ranked very high. And um, therefore we, we had this discussion, should we split the list or not, but we could not come up to any logical conclusion without the community and what the community wants. So that's why I posted the poll, but in the poll it's 60% say yes, and basically 40% say we should not split. So I really wonder, you know, for argument's sake, what we should Well, well the, the question that I would have, because I, is how do we identify a system as production or not? And that's, those are the kinds of questions that we have to answer if we want to split. And we've talked about this a lot internally, trying to decide what is what is that hard line that says something is a production system or not a production system. And you can see on the slides that, that are on the screen now, these are some of the questions that have to be answered uh, to decide that. And uh, just because it's a research file system, for example, doesn't mean it's not on a production system. And just because you don't have um, protected storage doesn't mean it's not on a production system. That site may have a policy that says, um, we need to get the last bit of performance out of our system, therefore compute at your own risk. We'd rather you recompute than spend the extra money to make a more robust storage system. And those kinds of things 
um, make it difficult. The other one is is the vendor submission for the, versus the end user submission. Um, a vendor can always go to a client, install it there, and then measure it and have the end user submit it. And it's still technically an end user submission, even though the vendor essentially loaned them the hardware as a an internal test for themselves. So where to draw these lines are difficult. And if we do want to split, then we have to have some definition of how to draw these lines. Yeah, and it gets I'm a little bit more client, tricky. So when... Go ahead. No, it's even more tricky when you look at, you know, people may be using cloud, right? On the one hand, you know, definitely some of the, the submission you know, we're just going to build a big cloud system to to have a high score, but obviously people do lots of production work in cloud environments, and so having a storage system or even a persistent storage system in the cloud is, you know, do you consider that production or not? Right? It's it's very difficult. Hard rules around what is what is production and what isn't. Right? Yeah, we're open to suggestions that people can come up with with reasoning behind them on how to draw these lines. Um, our internal discussions have revealed lots of these different questions and we haven't been able to come up with something that we can all agree on is a hard line on any of these. So um, if you have solid suggestions with reasoning, then let's go with it. Let's see, let's just talk about it. I would say, um one way to draw the line between production versus benchmark or uh, you know production versus research is is a combination of two factors one can someone outside your organization legitimately legitimately set up a system based on the file system that you are using if no, it's not a production file system or it's, or it's a vendor file system. And two, can users in your environment and do users in your environment use this storage that you are testing? If no, it's benchmark only. And you know, I've had stuff, I'm not a vendor. I've had stuff that I would definitely count as benchmark only because I don't let my users use it. Mm -hmm. It's a vendor loan thing, you know, so maybe three does the vendor want the system back, you know, <laughs> something yeah. like that. Um, I think these things are solvable. There just has to be some level of trust. I, I, you, know, I, you, you have to take people at their word sometimes. I liked it a lot. I think what we maybe can come up with is a list of questions, right? And then if, if maybe it will be like, it, this one is clear production, this one is clear research or non-production, and then there will be the gray area where you have to talk to the board how we classify it or we classify it maybe in between or something. So I think more, maybe a couple of questions could help us to do that. And I like the ones you asked. Can, can you maybe put them into the Slack again? Because I like uh, I, I, I got them in the notes. Yeah, I got them in the notes, Julian. Yeah. Maybe if it's five questions or so, and would be simple enough, right? Everyone can yeah. see how people classified it. It's part of the submission procedure. No big deal. The other thing to consider here as well is, you know, you could imagine, you know, we got seven questions here. You could have seven lists. I mean, really almost split into like 14 lists. And that's definitely not something that I think we want to see. So figuring out how to combine, uh, I like your Point, Ken, and, and how do we combine these kinds of, you know, the lines so that at least we end up with, you know, let's say, two lists or three lists or something to that effect, right, and avoid an explosion, I think, um, would be really helpful yeah, as maybe, well. Yeah, I mean, you could say, you know, is this a, per a, a permanent storage system or an ephemer ephemeral, you know, is it going to be containing data beyond the duration of the benchmark? Need to uh, wrap up. I think we're um, pretty much at the end of our time. Yeah. So, um, 
thank you everyone for joining us and congratulations again to uh, Intel and uh, Peng Cheng Laboratory for their success in the list this year. Bye. All right. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. Thanks,